and violence directed at American embassies over an awful internet video that we had nothing to do with. The people of Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Tunisia did not trade the tyranny of a dictator for the tyranny of a mob. Welcome back to WillCow. That was Hillary Clinton reacting to the violent anti-Muslim protests which continued in the Middle East today and have now spread across the Arab world. We're really supposed to believe that a crappy YouTube video caused all of this? It's turned into a global uprising against the United States, and it doesn't look like there's an end game in sight anytime soon. And what do you think the Obama administration is doing about it? Not a whole lot. It's a wait-and-see approach with a whole lot of apologies in between. When it comes to the president's foreign policy, this makes you think that there's not a whole lot of policy when it comes to the Middle East. Let me welcome back my guests, former Secret Service agent and Republican candidate in Maryland, Dan Bongino, and from the American Enterprise Institute, Michael Rubin. He's joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, Dan, I, I just... The apologies. I, I, almost, I almost can't take it and I want to throw up. It's apology after apology after apology for a moronic video. Right. Why are we even mentioning the video? By even mentioning it, it informally puts an imprimatur on it. Why are we are even mentioning this fool? You've now empowered millions of people to go on YouTube and what, start World War III? This is insanity. It was an excuse to blame instead of seeking some retribution and solving the problem for this. You know, we have to engage in some realpolitik, a U.S. first policy. You know, someone said the other day, well, should we have kept Mubarak in power? If it benefited the United States, yes. This apology. Yeah, nobody said he was a good guy. Right, no one's, exactly. I'm not having him over for dinner. I'm not interested. All we care about now is the United States comes first. Everything else is a secondary interest. And unfortunately, with this administration, uh, I don't think you can say with a straight face that that's the case anymore. Michael, I, I got to ask you, how is the Internet service in the Sudan? Because they're telling us this is not coordinated. This is a matter of fact, just random uprising. I think it's coordinated because... It's all just happening too fast right around 9-11. It's not just the Internet service that matters. It's the satellite television. And remember, it doesn't take much to, to create a mob and to create this fury in that part of the world. Ayatollah Khomeini had issued that fatwa, that death warrant, against Salman Rushdie, famously without ever having read his book. And it inflamed scores of Iranians about it. We're seeing the same phenomena here. The Middle East is a timber box, and uh, satellite television, just as much as the Internet, can, can provide the gasoline. Satellite television and the Internet, hmm, kind of like what we're broadcasting on right now. Let me ask you something. When the Muslim Brotherhood and the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood say, hey, hey we don't really want to do this, let's, let's, uh, let's help out the Americans, let's put chains around their, their, their embassy, this has already occurred. The cat's already out of the bag, for lack of a better phrase. Do you believe that they're invested in keeping this violence from occurring? Absolutely not. And what we really need to look at is the discrepancy between what the Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt has been tweeting in English when they sent out some nice, soft, uh, unicorn-esque, uh, fluffy <laughs> message about how we're so glad None of you, no Americans in the embassy were injured in the attacks, but the, at the same time, their Arabic feed was saying it was urging on the mob to protect the honor of the prophet and calling for a million people to march to the embassy today. It's that type of nonsense that we have to hold to account. The way to hold them to account is with regard to U.S. foreign aid. We're way past the time when U.S. foreign aid should be considered an entitlement to regimes, no matter how hostile they are to U.S. interests. Yeah, you're running for the Senate. The White House has already said they are not going to withhold foreign aid. My God, what... what? $1.3 billion for people that have stormed our embassy. This sure. is ridiculous. But here's the president, uh, president's foreign policy. Lick your finger. Where's the wind blowing? What's the focus group uh, tested poll data say for the day? Foreign policy should be, uh, foreign aid should be off the table right now. We shouldn't even be discussing it. I applaud anyone in Congress right now saying, forget it. We want them back. We want the funds back. We should be drawing a hard line. We have no red lines with this administration at all. We've abandoned our only ally in the region, Israel, and we basically have a bunch of, a bunch of anointed bureaucrats in suits in the White House fighting a war against terrorist savages who call us the great Satan. And are, are, I mean, we're, at the, we're on the brink right now, unfortunately. Of a, we're at a very dangerous time and at a crossroads. If we don't put a red line in the sand and say cross no 
further. And this doesn't happen to ha this doesn't have to happen openly. It can happen behind closed doors, and it has. It has to happen soon. I've been in these regions of the world. They do not. They do not recognize weakness. They don't. They only recognize strength. The men with the guns are the men with the power. It's unfortunate, folks, but this is the real world, not the world of Utopia University, not the world of your classroom. This is what really happens when, like Michael said, and he's right, ideology takes over and rationality sits in the back seat.